The dawn of civilization. Primitive. Dangerous. Exciting. The handwriting is on the wall. If the human race is ever going to amount to anything, it needs... The most civilized caveman I have ever seen. Ah, oh, look who's come out of his cave. You're listening to the Knuckle Drags Extravaganza on Z Digital if you're joining us live or via the magic of the internet at a later date through Cave Dweller Music. My name is Matt, and we've been playing a few tracks from the latest Lurid Orb. Oh, actually, it's a debut record now that I think about it. Uh, and we thought, what better way to celebrate the release than get the man behind the project, John, on to have a chat about it. First and foremost, John, thank you very much for taking some time and having a chat to us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for wrapping the album. And yeah, it, I guess it is weird to be back making music and doing this sort of stuff because it's been quite a while. So really appreciate 4ZZZ and your support. Um, yeah, it's been awesome. I do want to touch on uh, you getting back into music because I think that's a pretty interesting little rabbit hole to go down. But let's talk about Folded Visions in and of itself. It's come out recently um, and everything that I've seen around it, there is an underlying story that's connecting all of the tracks would you be happy to explain what that story is or uh, is it more of a let the listener find out? Um, I That's a good question. And this is kind of the, the, the process, I think, which is the trickiest for anyone doing narrative stuff, whether it's, you know, in writing or music. But basically, I really like uh, the narrative to be, you know, a, a situation of having the artist hold your hand through a process and then that process you pull. Um, bits and pieces from your own thing out of it. So it was definitely constructed pretty tightly and I wanted people to feel certain ways from certain tracks and have the, you know, for example, if you listen to the album on shuffle, you probably wouldn't get as much out of it, I don't think. So um, I was really inspired by a lot of the prior Dungeon Synth acts who had quite strong narratives and I like to write stuff myself. And um, so, yeah, I, I actually pieced it together like a little puzzle I had probably like four or five songs I knew I wanted to do. And then it was kind of like linking little bits into attach them exactly how you'd write an adventure fantasy novel, I guess. And that is the thing that I like about Dungeon Synth. And it seems to not be lost entirely as an art form or as a way of making a record, but having something that is a cohesive whole and everything complements each other rewards the listeners a little bit more that I found. Yeah, and I think also there is a little room um, to work with the listener because people are so used to, I mean, basically everyone that's listening to this genre has some experience with fantasy gaming or, you know, metal music. And so they're, they're kind of used to writing their own stories and having their own characters and things like that. So it's kind of like using that knowledge they have and then kind of, you know, pushing them into like corners of your world and, you know, probing them for for things that maybe, uh, I don't know, like a different experience. That was definitely conscious for sure. This is something that we mentioned before we started recording, and it is the fantasy, be it RPG or video game pipeline mm. into Dungeon Synth because that is too, well, it's a genre rather that kind of doesn't exist on its own accord. It's always tied into the fantasy stuff and then it also yeah. a lot of the imagery it it looks like it's just come straight out of the black metal playbook yeah i actually have i was probably i kind of coined my own term called chill wand music which was <laughs> like you know skyrim jeremy soul soundtrack stuff or like all those there's a lot of that stuff like cropping up where you can just listen to full old school soundtracks yeah 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 and i i listen to a lot of that stuff for work um as you know being a fantasy illustrator and stuff i tend to listen to whatever i'm doing in the picture so it's long form it was more more kind of atmospheric and but quite melodic and interesting because of you know you need interesting games so i actually probably started there and then found the dungeon synth synth niche after actually and um so i didn't have the usual path of coming from the metal way um, I really like metal, but that's not the reason. I didn't come in through the, the black metal door. So it's kind of weird. I think that, that sort of influenced my sound a lot. People think it's it's more soundtracky gamey, which I, I'd agree with that, you know. 
Yeah, I definitely came in it through the more traditional route of going through black metal and then hearing the ambient stuff that they do. And then mm. you kind of do progress down that way. But they're two quite nerdy genres in and of themselves. <laughs> Obviously, you can't go through um, five black metal bands without finding a reference to Tolkien. And a lot of dungeon synth plays off that. And then also there's, you know, the deep uh, D&D stage. You've got Pathfinder yeah. associated with it as well. So was your entry into it via the fantasy art side of things or yeah. were you playing yeah. some of those games yourself? No, nah, def- so I was, I remember being sort of six, five and six, and um, I, I just had like a good nose for quality fantasy stuff. So I remember re- trying to read the Dark Sun trilogy when I was seven, um, bought all those books, had Slain the Horned God, which is a 2000 AD comic um, when I was 10. Um, I had a lot of, I don't know, yeah, the art thing. I was really into Games Workshop, White Dwarf stuff. I had nice. no idea what it was for when I was really young. So you're just like, oh, man, it- these little figurines are awesome. Yeah, and you'd kind of have to imagine what they were for. Particularly yeah. um, the non, I, I remember buying a um, Magnum, Magnum Companion, which was for the fighting fantasy books, and no idea what they were for. And you sort of have to just kind of create that yourself. And then I was actually kind of disappointed to find out what, what they were for. You're like, oh man, and, I actually um, have to learn rules and you know roll yeah, dice just, and stuff. Oh, it's not. Yeah, it was really weird. So like, I actually kind of actually found getting into dungeon synth it kind of i really clicked into that youthful thing a little yeah. bit of like you know there was no rules or you didn't really there's there's a few rules i reckon but you can kind of do whatever you you want with it um but yeah it definitely came in through the art side of things and then i was always playing in bands and stuff um when i was younger so didn't really find a genre that completely like fit me perfectly for the long term so when i hit I honestly think that this is kind of the perfect thing for me. It's like a complete amalgam- amalgamation of all the things I'm interested in. Like, it's it's great. So what were the bands that you played in previously? But you mentioned <sighs> there that you um, are a big fan of metal and, you know, a lot yeah. of... Quite late to metal, honestly. Yeah. Like, um, I was really a grunge kid, uh, which is... Um, I was from... I didn't have, like, my parents, oh, I hope they're not going to listen to this, but they didn't really have very good <laughs> taste in music um, or, you know, I'm the eldest in my family. So I was the first one to kind of. That's right. You know, I'm the same. I, I yeah, understand that feeling all too rock well. Rock the boat and you'd have to convince everyone that it's not all, you know, bad. But, yes, it started with grunge. And I think grunge is really, it's good to kind of, like, get you going, but it's actually quite reducing, reductive in yeah. terms of, like, being good at instruments and stuff. Like I remember hating <laughs> on metal because they were too flouncy or, you know, the hair. Well, it gives you this attitude. And so, like, it took me a while to actually shake that off. And then I started to get into, like, psychedelic stuff um, a bit later. And we – I actually – probably my first major band was, you could say, almost like a 60s slash Brit pop sounding thing, which was – didn't – we all had mop tops and all that kind of crap. And um, but I was really interested in the psychedelic side of it, and that didn't last long. And quickly, we went into like um, another group, Idle Cranes, which was more like underground garage DIY um, stuff, like quite druggy and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, we we kind of were playing. We were going pretty well. Moved to London for a while with that band, split up, and then um, probably the the main band that people would know me for around the traps. A bit of ancient history is a band called Gaza Strips, which is more like goth, cold wave. And I, I thought that that was kind of my thing, but it wasn't quite. <laughs> it was. It's on the precipice of it because you've still got a lot of the um, what's it with the? Yeah, I just felt like it. It just it's kind of you hit a wall with it, and um, it's quite fashiony. Yeah, and people like to pose around and take you know it's it's a little too much like of the that aesthetic and, basis. Yeah, I think so. And it was getting like really popular when we were sort of around. Like it was, well, it's super. It's it's basically a, a main genre now. But um, yeah, that was quite a while ago. And yeah, it was it was like I really enjoyed playing with my my mates in that band, and we had a really good good time. But it just sort of hit a wall. 
and then I just didn't do anything for ages. And I'm just not technically good enough to jump into a metal band unless I was going to do like do metal on bass or something like that. And yeah, it just sort of the the kind of stars aligned with Dungeon Synth, and it just sort of seemed to you know be perfect for me. I know where you're coming from, though. I um, started out as a hardcore kid, and you know yeah. it is a great entry point. However, you can't really go back and appreciate it as much as you once no, did, because, yeah. like you said, with grunge, it's quite a reductive way of looking at it. Like I'm still no major fan of prog music because I'm sitting there going, like, "What do you got a 15 minute song for, man? Like I'm like, yeah. 30 seconds, get in, get out." Yeah. But in saying that, though once you sort of pull back from the really reductive and and it's a youthful thing as well once you pull back yeah. from that you can kind of get into things a little bit more well we were the i reckon the last genre um or uh, the last sorry the last um era of you, your band being kind of like a gang you had to kind of have like a gang of similar people that yeah. to get your get your sort of thing happening and like I think it's probably good that that doesn't happen anymore because people are more open minded. But you sort of had to believe your own shit um, with your own band, and yeah, it's kind of weird. Like it's strange. A lot of the bands I used to hate when I was younger, um, I like the most now, and the ones I used to like the most back then, I don't really, they don't really resonate with me anymore. But I was really always into classical music too, so it was you know, you know, it's just all the things kind of meeting up with dungeon synth and and i don't have to worry about being in a band you don't have to go and play live and um rehearse and worry about other people and stuff which was i just didn't have the energy as like an older dude to do that anymore <laughs> it's just too much effort so with it being a solo project how do you go about creating stuff for lurid orb from the ground up is it a case where you see a cool idea in a comic book or in a fantasy novel and then try and work out how to spin it or create the soundscape for that in your own head? Like what's your process? Yeah. of? I actually kind of, I think a lot of people find it and then jump into action with it too early. Um, I actually let the genre, like I joined all the forums, paid attention to like Dungeon Synth Archives and In the Woods, which are some on YouTube channels, which had like, really post the best stuff and kind of just sat and watched and made notes mentally of like, you know, what do the good guys do? Like, how do they best communicate this stuff without it being like, Hey, check out my new thing. Whoop, whoop, whoop. It's cause I, there's kind of, yeah, I think if, if you have the wrong methodology around that, you almost cook your project to begin with. Like, um, so kind of like sitting around just paying attention for a few years, really actually, getting into the genre before I even started doing anything. And then um, I'm kind of fortune favored me because I became uh, massively in touch with an old friend of mine who runs a um, basically like a tech synth channel, um, Aaron, who's from the Mystic Scepter um, label thing that we have called his Myth Scribe. And he basically set me up because I'm not usually technologically technologically minded but he just set me up and said download this what do you want here and sort of did all my back of house stuff so i didn't really have to work very hard for that and just set it all up and i'd, I'd use reaper and um you know those sort of programs before so that's kind of the hard thing part of it done but yeah he sort of set me up and he's like now go and i just had all this awesome stuff um which i built upon but yeah it was very lucky that i had aaron around to to help me with that path and i think the tech setup is really crucial you need to have something that works for you and not too much stuff so it's quite um you're limited a bit but with the creative side of it in terms of coming up with with all the ideas and it's with my work this is what i do like all the time so it's just about like harnessing good ideas and pulling narrative ideas and visuals together and you just yeah, you you kind of just make little notes like my little tome I have of all the songs. There's basically written notes of what the song's going to be, quite ironclad before I even begin working on them and stuff like that. I really enjoy that you use the uh, the term tome to describe <laughs> where you've yeah. written it. That's very on brand. But yeah. one thing that you mentioned there, um, 
And it's something that I've sort of been grappling with, with dungeon synth and noise and ambient and those kind of, for lack of a better term, abstract genres is it can be hard for people getting into the genre from a listener's perspective to work out what's actually good and yeah. what isn't. In your mind, what are, say, three main components that you would say make good dungeon synth? I actually have a list of composers that I record because it's particularly with it being such a, like a hugely inter- international um, genre too where quite often things are in different languages and whatever. Like I wrote, I write down stuff because it's easy to listen to something and then it disappears and you can't remember what it was. Oh, boy, but, don't I know that feeling. Yeah, so I would, if anyone's looking to get into it, write down your band as soon as you, you're like, I like this one. And you, for me pers- personally, I think like I'm a massive melody guy. Um, I like melodic structuring and that kind of thing, which is sometimes seen as a bit uncool for dungeon synths, but I, I think that that's a load of horse shit. Um, and then also the kind of like the atmospheric element. So like, you know, where does the songs, where does it transport you to? And then I think having a really tight um, aesthetic with your concept like um, rather than being um, a little, there's a couple of artists I think who are a bit too all over the place and release too much stuff and it's a bit confusing. And I, yeah, I, but yeah, mainly melody and like um, atmosphere, I think, and not carrying on too long. I think there's only a very few guys that can do that well. Like Ben Caldea comes to mind. His, some, some of them are like big art pieces, but that's not really what I do. I just sort of admire from afar, but yeah, I try and not carry on too, too much. Those longer ones can get into the realm of sound design and stuff that you'd see at a, like a museum of modern art. Yeah. Yep. Which there's a place for that for sure. And there's people that take this really seriously. I've, I've talked to them before. I mean, I take it seriously, but I kind of always have this like little smidge of sort of um, almost like a childhood mentality to it, which is kind of like young and fresh. And so it's kind of, yeah, I, I appreciate those guys, but that's not what I do. Um, I think the guy that really, there was two albums that really like, once I heard them, I was like, okay, cool. I've I got to pull the trigger on this, which was like uh, Aerith Akbi. Um What is that album called? Hold on. I'll consult my list. Uh, it is, oh, his last one. What was it? I'll, I'll get back to that. And Landstriker, which were like much tighter and um, not poppier, but sort of just more succinct with their, yeah, A Lantern Swathe was Aerith Ackby's album. And it's really like solid songwriting wise. It's really punchy in bits. So, yeah, I listened to that and was like, yeah, this is, okay, cool. I think there's like a a group of people who are willing to listen to this type of stuff. But you hit the nail pretty spot on there with it needing to be succinct because sometimes it can come across as meandering, but then you also need to thread that balance between a lot of people are going to have this on as background music, but you don't want it to be dull background music, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's the ones that I I find struggle uh, with engaging people. um, They kind of just, it's all about them. It's all about the composer. It's like, come, come into my world and just listen to me, you know, expressing myself for like forever. And it just, after a while, you're like, nah, I've just, I've worn out (laughs) this. Like I need, there needs to be some bounce to it, I reckon. We mentioned there, um, Mystic Scepter. How did the partnership with you two come about? It sounds like um, from what you said there that it was an old friend that you had reconnected with. Yeah, actually, um, Aaron, his old band, uh, which is the Shoegaze band, um, used to play with my old like psych garage band back in the day, ages ago. And then he moved to England and Scotland for 
I think 30, it's over there for 10 to 13 years or something like that. And then he moved back and we started playing um, D&D over Discord during COVID. Nice. And he's he's my DM actually. And um, we still do. And yeah, we just started talking and we both were sort of in a similar bag of wanting to get back into music, but not wanting it to be like a thing thing, like a band thing. Yeah, and, it's a major um, commitment and like trying to organize two people in a room together is hard enough. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you want to run a duo, that's that's all well and good. But yeah. Yeah. It yeah, can, definitely. It can... Yeah, uh, yeah. And and we we just kind of were sitting around talking forever and ever. And it was actually him that sort of pushed me into doing it. He's like, Don't you like aren't you obsessed with dungeon synth? Why don't you just do a thing like that? And I'm like, Well, man, I I don't know how to set up mini vsts and all that kind of shit like i i just don't he's like it's so easy now you're thinking 15 years ago and he was right it's it's a lot easier to do it now but you do need a little bit of knowledge but um yeah i was like okay uh and then it just sort of started to happen but he he kind of then got swayed into doing his own thing which was hilarious and um yeah we just sort of got more and more into it and we just talk about you know we talk about a lot of gaming stuff and music stuff you know to to the nth degree and we're not we don't want mist acceptor to be like a label to release things like you know we're not going to distribute stuff or import um or handle export actually um i've got pete from brilliant emperor who will handle handle that Nice. Those so, guys yeah. have put out some really good stuff recently. Yeah, we we have. If you want to um, hot off the presses, bit of information. We're, there's going to be the first drop of um, Folded Visions coming out through them. And yeah, I be, saw that today. That's cool. Tape release. Yeah, there's going to be a long sleeve shirt um, and the like a bookmark set of eight bookmarks themed around the songs. So, what we, we, what it's just with Aaron and I. Aaron can he mastered my record um and definitely had a huge influence on it that way and so we kind of were like you know if people want to reach out to us and he can do the sound side of dungeon synth stuff um and i can handle the visual side we could effectively help or you know put our mystic scepter thing on something on people's projects and whatever but at this point in time we're not really interested in being a label it's more just like a, a collective um pivot point Going back not, to the old cold wave gang kind of stuff. Yeah, just kind of like it's sort of just like a be part of a club or something. Um, it, we may expand to other people, but um, like there's so many good Australian acts, but they seem to be all like spread out <laughs> and don't communicate with each other. So it's quite easy. Like I've started talking to some of them. Some of these guys were absolute idols of mine and they're just like, you know, Tier and uh, Questmaster and stuff. And we're, you know, we might get them to come up and play gigs at places like Netherworld and whatever. But yeah, we're not really hugely interested at this point of like putting stuff out. We've we've got Brilliant Emperor for that. You know, he's he's really good at that. So why would we tread on those toes? It just doesn't make any sense. But in terms of trying to create a little bit of a community around what we do, we're definitely down for that. Um, Brilliant Emperor have put out some great stuff. I interviewed the guys from uh, Mammon's Throne a little bit earlier yeah, on in the year. Yep, great yep. stuff coming out through there. How did you oh, guys man. get in touch with um, Brilliant Emperor? Oh, this, I mean, I, the other side of me getting into Dungeon Sense 2 was just a good excuse to do a crazy painting for the cover <laughs> and, and, and hopefully maybe, um, you know, segue into some work in the genre that way yeah uh, which has actually happened but I, I did um some cover art for like idle ruin and feculent and i've got a couple more um i've got stellar remains which is a black metal um sci-fi black metal band and um caleb from idle ruins got his project coming out so that's like i actually was talking to the black blood audio guy um you know the guys from there and oh uh, uh brendan yeah and, and so like i they started the, doing um guy behind snorlax he was a great chat so oh yeah and and they just put on a cold day in brisbane which was amazing but um a cold day out was it yeah a cold day but in brisbane yeah yeah that's the one yeah which was just it was almost too much but 
yeah, I came in through the art side of doing stuff for the the metal guys, and I just sneakily used used that in with um, Pete from Billion Emperor to be like, "Hey, would you?" It was kind of funny because I was like, "Hey, would you be interested in sort of putting this out for me?" And he's like, "You wouldn't believe it, but I'm actually sort of writing you an email right now." So it's kind of like <laughs> funny, yeah. So it was just all, all like I said, all the stars kind of aligned in the right way. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's. I haven't really had to work hugely hard to get the no, network of the release going, uh, which is usually one of the hardest things to to do. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty pretty awesome how supported it's it's gone, I guess. And how have you fa- have you found rather the response to the release of Folded Visions? I was looking at it's been um, insane. The honestly, YouTube like, channel and there's like guys from Finland. I know. Big, big I get ups. messages from, you know. Probably the, the best one I ever got was a uh, French dude who's like, I'm sitting in this like ancient castle listening to you. He sent me a screenshot of him and like, like these are the stuff that I like have in all my books to use for my paintings and stuff. And he's just sitting there on yeah, headphones yeah. listening. And I'm like blown away by that stuff. Um, yeah, it's just been crazy um, to have such a huge amount of like coverage and interaction with people because that's one thing the genre definitely has like everyone just likes to talk to other people that do it because it's it's such a niche thing so like everyone's very nice and amiable and want to want to talk to you and stuff so it's it's cool it's it's amazing it actually blows my mind i can't quite believe it i think that is self-serving but in a good way and you mentioned how niche of a genre it is Mm. It kind of goes back to forming that gang and that community that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, I had a little bit of a headache early on because, you know, there's a lot of um, anonymity, anim- 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 <laughs> being yeah. anonymous. There you go. Yes. Um, Which is one of the big things that I find just from a, a purely boring back end, um, like APRA and AMCOS perspective is trying to work out, okay, so obviously, four triple Z has uh, quotas of stuff that we need to play. How do you know where they're from? You know, how do you know if there's, uh, where, you know, if it's yeah. from Australia? Where, yeah. Is it new? You know, is, are there who's in the yeah. band? Because they're all using pseudonyms and hiding behind this wall of anonymity. Yeah, there you go. I wish I could have borrowed your pronunciation then. Um, but I kind of like. Firstly, because I was trying to use it as a way to maybe like spruik a bit of my like illustration stuff, using that was never going to be an option. No. But I, I, to be honest, I kind of have, I have a, I don't mind if people want to do that, but I want to know like it's good to talk about the craft, you know, with other people that do it and, and sort of interact. I think that largely that side of it is kind of going away now. I think people are way more comfortable. Um, kind of, you don't have to put your name everywhere, but just at least having a presence. Um, but yeah, when it's going, first... members of this band are X, Y, Z. Yeah, or just yeah. This when I first started getting into it, like people just would not want you to know anything about them or whatever. And I don't know. I just like kind of learning about how people do write their music and i think there's been you know quagmire mag and a few of the fanzines and some of the books that have come out with some really really interesting um rundowns of like writing process or you know concepts or you know these sort of chats or whatever like i i love that stuff always have so i'm all for like share who you are you don't have to like put your name up there in lights but yeah i prefer it for sure one of the things that you've been talking about throughout the interview, and you said it was kind of not a backdoor way of getting into Dungeon Synth, but your art, it was something that got you into the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you've always had in the back of your mind? You used to read you read comics, you know, the fantasy art. How did yep. that turn from an interest into a career? Well, I always... <sighs> I, I showed kind of, I guess, like innate ability from a very young age. So I was always super supported and actually went straight out of school into uni to study fine arts um, here at QCA. And 
then in that process, I always wanted to be a book illustrator or a comics artist or something like pretty much what I do now. But um, at that time, we were the last twist in the tail of like postmodernism. And those kind of views we've seen is very, very not kosher. And the illustration unit kind of folded for a couple of years when I was there. And I just ended up in like abstract painting and fine art and stuff, which was good, is good to know. But I had to find a path back. And so I didn't really do a lot of art stuff for a long time because I was just playing bands and partying and being, you need to be focused if you're actually going to have a proper, proper career in it. And then, I actually traveled to London, came back and quite quickly got into the thick of it and realized that it, you need to be organized, disciplined, um, you know, whether you like it or not, you have to kind of do social media shit, all that kind of stuff. And put so, yourself out there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uncomfortable, but it's it's you gotta do it. Like you have to. There's no real other option if you're gonna build your business. So I was a bit late to starting what I wanted to do right from the start, but um, it kind of gathered like you get the ball rolling and then it just sort of starts taking care of itself. So like I'm always pretty busy with that, which is, I mean, a huge blessing and it's it's awesome, but it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, yeah, I mean, doing the music stuff was kind of like you know, certain people play golf on weekends. I do Dungeons and that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be my like little side hobby thing that I do that just doesn't have any consequence. And then it just went so well that I was like, oh, actually, screw that. Let's 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 go for it. <laughs> and it, you can feel a bit gross and a bit dirty putting yourself out there from the start. And you feel like, you know, yeah. you go, man, I, I don't have this big of an ego. Why am I trying to promote myself so hard? Yeah, it's it is a weird one. Um I I've been kind of lucky that it's sort of taken care of itself. Like I honestly think that most people just click on the sidebar if they see my stuff because of the the stupid album cover. It's so ridiculous. Um so that was kind of conscious. I wanted to have something that people were going to be like it's not, they're not like looking at me promoting my own stuff. They're more like, I have to click this album because it looks so ridiculous and crazy. And I, I reckon, honestly, a lot of that had to do, a lot of the coverage had to do with that. With the cover of it. Yeah. And like, consequently, it sort of did have a, a huge impact on my, um, like, people internationally following my art and stuff, which has been really cool. So, Yeah. I guess it was sort of an unwitting plan, but it worked. One that's definitely worked. Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, I also just really actually enjoyed the process of of doing the album and releasing it and writing it and doing all that stuff. Like I really, often with my my art stuff, it's really a war. It's a very different mind space where it's kind of, I take that very seriously and always am pushing to get better. And it's a, it's a far different um mind space to be honest so was it from all of the fantasy stuff that you consumed as a kid you turn that into um a lot of the inspiration that you've got now i I think so i think so i've always been active i'm also uh, with the genre i mean fantasy's become so hugely popular now and and kind of homogenized really that's Um, what can I, I just want to interject here. Do you kind of miss the days when if you're in a fantasy and sci-fi, you're a bit of an outsider nerd? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Because like I, that's the thing that. It's a really tough one, hey. I had, on... to, I had to reckon with for, for the longest time because I remember reading comic books as a kid and, you know, reading sci-fi books as a kid and everyone goes, dude, what the fuck are you reading, you weirdo? Yeah. But now, you know. Everyone has a favorite comic book hero, and uh, the witch is yeah. really popular as well. But uh, you kind of, yeah, it's that weird catch twenty two of man. I used to get, I used to get heinously, yeah, <laughs> strung out for this. But on the flip side, you kind of go, well, I mean, if if people getting into it now don't have that barrier, I, I guess it's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's I've got a pretty like massive quality control. Um, filter for stuff. So if like stuff's not v- very good, but it's things that I've 
nostalgically liked. I won't just like it because I used to like, and there's a, there's a heap of that, that there's a, so much bad stuff, particularly on the writing front. Like I really love writing, like things need to be well written for me and well, like the canon has to be sorted out really tightly for me. Like if, if something's just all over the shop, I just switch off immediately. So yeah. um, I actually think that with the bubble, the huge bubble, which I reckon is just burst with a, you know, streaming services losing their mind and Marvel, you know, just milk and everything and Disney oh, yeah. milk, you know, and what's happening in the gaming front. But there's always like, you know, things like the the Dark Souls series with Miyazaki, who is massive on quality control. So I kind of have probably gone into finding those areas where people are really like careful, more careful with it all. Um, so it's yeah, it's it, it is a weird one because you find yourself having more conversations with people about stuff, but plenty of people out there, in my opinion at least, don't really like it for the right reasons. Um, certainly not the reasons I liked it when I was a kid. So what do you what have you found has been the most well constructed and and well told canon of a story? Um, What's I, a favorite I, of yours? Yeah, I mean honestly, um, I'm not. I don't have a huge amount of time for gaming and I'm not very good at games, but I'm the I, same. I, yeah, I can entirely empathize. I, I, I that. have watched a lot of lore videos around the Dark Souls series and, mm. and the Elden Ring stuff. And the guy is extremely interesting with what he, he puts forward. There's lots of, um, you know, metaphorical stuff without it being um, too like literal for like occult imagery and alchemical ideas and mysticism and, you know, uh, you know the archetypal things from Carl Carl Jung and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's like I like that side. I mean, obviously Tolkien is is huge. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a few out there. I don't think there's like you know when I was younger, I used to love things like Wheel of Time and all that, but I just don't think it's done as well as you get older. I reckon there's actually going to be a bunch of really good stuff coming out soon because people are so sick of it. You know, like I reckon there'll be in the next like five years or so some really good new things come out, but we'll just have to see. They'll be small. You'll have to find them. So it's kind of like how grunge was a, a kick back to all the hair metal. There's going to be. Yeah, uh, yep. a kick, a kick back to the oversaturation. Yeah, yep. And I, I mean, with the comics thing, like I don't even really think of comics anymore um, because they're just so it's they're just so basic. Like people think that there's all these huge amounts of depth to a lot of those stories and worlds and stuff, but there's not really not no. not not on mass. Like I'm the, the graphic. There's some graphic novels which are a bit different, but yeah, I don't really look a lot in that area um, uh, i'm gonna be a hypocrite here because i i am looking to actually do a fully painted mythic graphic novel with dungeon synth soundtrack down nice. the track but you know well, let's talk about that in a couple of years that's a really immersive way of doing it but no i i agree um i went through a big stage of comics there but i find myself more into that deep south americana graphic mm-hmm. novels but mm-hmm. um i think i'm two maybe three editions into stray bullets which was really good yeah um, yeah that was really good there was yeah i haven't Oops. finished that of yet there was another great one and i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head but i've got i think that was a crazy I, i'm kind of, the one i haven't done yet but i i basically know that it's kind of what I need to do next is is berserk. Oh, um, same. Yeah. So, like, I've heard that that's kind of that the kind of world that we're talking about um, being fully realized, and a lot of you know, I, I just like the world. The world building side of it is so important to me, and either I think things have great worlds and terrible stories and characterization, or it's you know terrible world, worlds and great characterization so um yeah it's kind of weird i don't actually ingest a lot of quality content these days to be honest like it's just <laughs> not it's just not around um there's very few i mean abercrombie abercrombie as a writer's probably one um there's a few around but I, i'm kind of too busy doing the work to actually 
consume a lot of what I'm into. So, yeah, it's weird. You mentioned there with the uh, the great world shit stories or shit world's great stories. One of my yeah. favorite ways that writers and Frank Herbert does this great. Um, I'm a really big fan of June, but oh yeah, June. Uh, you know what, June. June is what I'm talking about. That's really good. I I like how the story and the world kind of unfolds in front of you, whereas a lot of things have, for lack of a better term, like an Avengers Assemble scene where they sit (laughs) down and go, this is what's happening here. This is what we will achieve. And you go, you've kind of just taken, you know, all of the fun of exploring and finding out new things because you've sat us down. Not yeah. how, and like, instead of holding your hand and walking you through it, which is something that you've done with Folded Visions, they basically sat down and gone, open up, here comes the story. Yeah. Um, and it's, I guess, like, with the song titles and the, the theories around or the, the vibes around each of the tracks, it's kind of like, I've told you what it is and sort of I've hopefully laid out what's happening you will decide the visuals, you know, what's in your head about what's actually everything looks like and what's going on. And I I like that a lot more. Um, And getting into like RPG, like, you know, role-playing games, not computer games. I've gotten to D&D a lot in the last few years and we we actually shit-canned like 5e, the latest rule set, because it was too, you know, Hero Ball, Avengers-like. We call it Avengers D and D. So we actually like reduce everything way down to like the oh. rudimentary bits, and <laughs> and and it creates so much more drama. And so yeah, it's these are the like because Aaron, as I said, Aaron from Mystic Scepter and Miscribe, he's my DM. So we, we kind of take all of our ethos around this stuff and put it into practice with what we do, and it just seems to work out better. We reckon so. I'm so glad that you mentioned that about 5e because there's a long running thing uh, on Cave Dweller, uh, on the Knuckle Drags mm. Extravaganza, sorry, is just my co host and I just can't stand, can't stand the rule set of 5e. Like Dungeon Crawl, Crawler Classic, Old School Essentials, really fun. You know, you just, you're going into a dungeon, yeah. you're, you're bashing a whole bunch of gremlins and you're taking some loot. Yeah. I find with, 5e that there's just there's too many dice like you can min max <laughs> you can min max too much and people oh, end man. up you you need to get Aaron on because he, he's just all for less choice of just leave it up to me you don't get to you know yeah. have all these these extras and bells and whistles he's like it's really rudimentary like and, my, da- and dangerous that dangerous exact I was going to say have you played uh, Call of Cthulhu before yeah um. God, I think I played a session like, oh, man, it must be ages and ages ago. But I think our group's gearing up for that. But, yeah, we are really excited by the look it of is, that. It is probably my favourite system because there's, like, the the sense of danger is real and imminent. And it's not just from, you know, the, the Lovecraftian monsters that are about. It's, you know. It's you going you're, insane, isn't it? Or something? Yeah, like yeah. insanity is a great thing, but also you're just a regular old person, and if someone yeah. shoots you, you you can like just die straight yep. up. Um, yep. and if you do play an extended one, the power increase or the power creep makes sense. One of my favorite little mechanics is, say, for example, you know, you you're driving a car. If you've driven a car at the end of the session, you can improve that skill because you've driven a car during that. Like, it's just, it's so yep. well thought out. And yep. I'm not a really uh, big fan of Lovecraft, but, it, I'll, you know, I can forgive him because he, he inspired a really good game. Uh, I, I His stories and writing are, like, incredible. Like, yeah, the dude was obviously pretty fucked up. But um, I feel like you had to be to write that sort of stuff, uh, though. Yeah, and... He, he was a, clearly from a very weird, unhealthy, you know, world with yeah. his family <laughs> and where he came from. But, like, in terms of his writing, it's, like, there's also I really love the Yellow King um, uh, stuff from – who wrote that? Let me just quickly look it up. The King in Yellow. 
um, who was kind of a precursor by, yeah, Robert Chambers, similar oh, right. thing. Where yeah. you, you should check that out where it's like um, the King in Yellow, I think part of the mythos finds its way into the Lovecraft stuff. But, again, you don't know anything about what the fuck that he's talking about. No. It's just he'll – give you all this information that works within itself but you've got no idea really like what the hell is going on and it's so good it's really good in that way yeah i do prefer books that are just very much more vague way way more vague is good for me uh, you better start reading philosophy then you, my should, you should, you should. <laughs> we, yeah yeah we um we've also got another um D campaign where magic exists but it's actually banned Oh, I love that. So we every time you like need to use it or you find something that's like absolutely just gonna be a problem. You can't just whip it out whenever you like. So yeah, this thing I I, I like all that stuff. Um we of course are gonna there was something that I did want to bring up. Ah, Netherworld fantasy art. Mm. You have had quite a few shows um, yeah, yep. at Netherworld, and from memory, the last one for you died had some Dungeon Synth there as well. Dude, we played Dungeon Synth for eight hours straight at that show. We had the Tia Hour of Power. Um, shout out to Tia Oiton down in Sydney. Been talking to him quite a lot. He was like a massive influence on me uh, with Basopolis, which is a great album. But yeah, we just I just handpicked all this dungeon synth and we just had this massive playlist that was going in the ba- background whilst all the the show was on and it was it was a, it was a vibe man like people were loving it and um then we had a couple of performances as well um Aaron played live with Miss Scribe which was just crazy good and um Tal from the studio she goes he uh, he did a like Dark Souls themed set, and nice. yeah, it was just killer. But it's amazing how many people came up and were like, "Man, what is this music? It's so it's so good." And I was like, "Yeah, like people don't know; they should know, but they don't know about it." And I feel like Netherworld, and especially with the show that you guys put on, that is almost a perfect introduction because a lot of people who are really big fans of Dark Souls would also like the lore yep. and the aesthetic behind Dungeon Synth, whereas you prefer the Dungeon Synth, not so much the video game aspect of Dark Souls, but you like the lore and everything behind it. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I have played quite a lot of Elden Ring, the new one, and it's just, I just, I'm so slow. Like, by the time I'm anywhere, all my mates have already completed the game many times over. So like, I can't engage on that level. It's more just a thing for me to do when I'm, like, flaked out. But um, I definitely do engage with, you know, the lore. And I've watched a lot of those videos and the aesthetic. And it's kind of weird to have something be so influential on what you do, but you you don't necessarily actually... Engage with it yourself. Yeah, which I don't mind. I really don't mind. Um, And I think another, you know, a good example is like the other Miyazaki, the one that does the anime movies, like... The Studio Ghibli. Yeah, like it's just a, it's, it's been hugely influential with how vague a lot of that stuff is. And I just think there needs to be a bit more of that kind of thing going on. But yeah. But the gaming side of it, like I just don't have the time to, to engage on the level that my mates do. It's crazy how much they play. I just cannot do it. I do a little bit of tabletop and stuff, but that's about it. Yeah. And I, am of a similar vein. I also find that it's quite hard for me to get mentally prepared for it. Yeah, if, if, you're not good, if you're not good at these games and whatever, like, it's actually not relaxing to play them. No, it's, like, proper yeah. stressful, whereas, you know. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like you and I are the same with this. Like, other people can't understand why I just don't. It's like, I'm just not conditioned. I'm a bit older. I'm just not conditioned to sort of being in this way and, you know, naturally being able to just like clock in and out that's not me yeah and it's just i think as well for me at the very least rpgs are a very social thing and you can kind of like uh, and getting back to one of my favorite topics shitting on 5e it's too like the amount of rules in it becomes way too constricting oh yeah 
And the, the DMs don't have a good time because there's just too much shit to, that you're, can go on. Yeah, you're just sitting there trying to rules lawyer and yeah. work out the yeah. rate of someone falling and what damage that they need to take. Yeah, it's almost to the point now where we might start looking at other things um, to to do. But most of what we play is like so customized and and like hacked up that it's barely even proper D and D actually. But it, it is in in terms of what the model is because it's such, yeah. you know, the first couple of editions one to three are like so you know good. I mean, second one yes and no, but we don't get too carried away with the you know, that side of it. But yeah, 5e for me just doesn't usually work long-term, I don't reckon. So we've covered um, Folded Visions. You mentioned that there is some merch coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks for that. But what is lined up for the rest of 2023 for yourself, be it the art side of things, uh, more stuff with Lurid or what have we got coming up? Well, yeah, I've got a... Well, I, I got married this week actually so that's sort of put a big um sort of strange doorstop in the way um but that's all done now so i've got a bunch of commission paintings and stuff like that to do i think i'm about to start on the second album actually i've been starting to make notes and pull together things and nice i think i was thinking about it too much like when when people actually start listening to your music you you, you start to second guess yourself and just, I just was like, everyone around me was, you know, Helena, my wife was like, no, just do what you did last time, but just it'll be different because I get bored really fast Yeah, in general. I just get too bored. And so things will change. But, yeah, I have. I, I think I'll try and get that cranking and hopefully I can have um, the album maybe done by like, I don't know, say March or April next year um for release maybe it'll be quicker than that i don't really know but definitely i just want to work on lurid or as a project and maybe work with aaron with miss acceptor to try and figure out some other things we can do around it and help to sort of build the genre in australia a bit particularly in brisbane but um i'll, I'll always be busy um i think next year my goal is to engage more with some of the personal projects i have which if I can find the time to do them, I think they'll go all right. Um, it's just it's that, a is, that is the constant curse, isn't it? Yeah. You need the money, you need the time. So it's like just trying to figure out how um, to make the freelancer. You get so absorbed into trying to like, you know, cover what you have to do to live that it doesn't leave a whole heap of space for other things. But I reckon I kind of need to start looking in that direction a bit more. But, yeah, Lurador, I'm, like, super keen to get involved with the second album and get that moving again. I don't want to be, like, I want to release, like, you know, five albums plus down the road and just stick with it for sure. If people did want to get in touch with you or keep up to date with Lurid Orb or the art stuff, where would the best channels for them to be? Um, probably the easiest way to talk to me would be I have an Instagram set up. Um, which is just at Lura underscore orb. Um, and then just if you search for me in Google, my band camp should come up or just just email me or write to me or, you know, generally I, I, I'm connected with my art pages too. So, like, I'm all for if you want to talk to me about stuff or ask me questions or tell me about your own thing, like, please do. That would be great. Well, I really appreciate you taking some time out. No and, worries. Thanks uh, for having me. I was just like, absolutely like amazed that you guys were kind of pumping my record without me knowing and without you knowing that I was from Brisbane and stuff that was kind of mind-blowing so um yeah it's uh dungeon synth reaches worldwide but uh yeah. it's a pretty small world actually <laughs> yeah yeah it is it's it, it is amazing how like some of my the big dogs that I was like really really into how how many of them I kind of like talk to on the side now. It's really strange. <laughs> All righty. And that is going to be a good place to stop that there. Cool. Again, thank you very much for taking some time out and having a chat. Oh, I really no appreciate worries. it. Thanks. Oh, really. Thanks a million for having me on and just, yeah, super pumped to uh, spread the word and talk about some cool shit because, yeah, um, plenty of my friends are kind of, you feel like a bit of an evangelical person with this because not everyone gets it.